I've uh, came to know uh, Serge Berdugo uh, when King Hassan, late King Hassan of Morocco, was trying to mobilize the Jewish lobby to help his country in the Green March to the Western Sahara. That was around 75. And that was the beginning of a beautiful relationship between Israel and Morocco, which then led, because of Mr. Abbas, Abu Mazen, at the time, because of his close relationship with the Moroccan government in the mid-70s, it was also, in a way, the beginning of the Oslo process, but certainly the beginning of the process which led to peace between Israel and Egypt back in uh, 79, uh, because the first negotiations, as I'm sure most of you remember, took place in Morocco uh, in secret, although the chief of Egyptian intelligence was hiding behind the curtain <laughs> when Moshe Dayan and Tohami were uh, talking about whatever they were talking. I have to tell you that I'm a night bird. I work on television, so speaking early in the morning, uh, and this is early in the morning for me, uh, I'm not always in agreement with whatever I'm going to tell you, so <laughs> please take me with a grain of salt. I'm especially embarrassed because my wife is here, and I'm not accustomed to giving talks in her presence. Uh, I'll offer you an observation about what's going on now uh, in the region, of course from an Israeli perspective. I'll begin with a quote from uh, Bismarck, 150 years ago. Bismarck, before the reunification of Germany, said that if you want to know what is the future course of history, you have to listen to the hoofbeats of the horses running in the distance. A leader of Hamas, somebody that I considered the number one intellectual in Hamas today, a friend of mine, Ahmed Youssef, picked up this quote of Bismarck. And he's saying now, I'm putting my ear to the ground, and I'm hearing the hoofbeats of the horses running. And that's the Islamist divisions running to power. I share with him the concern that behind what we see on our television screens every night now, the protests and demonstrations of people uh, demanding freedom and calling for democracy and our hearts go out for them. Yes, we would like to have democracy installed everywhere in the region. But we cannot ignore the concern that what is coming is not necessarily the Twitter and the Facebook boys. Many of you, I'm sure, have heard about the incident in Liberation Square Tahrir Square in Cairo, where the exiled the spiritual leader of the Muslim Brotherhood, over 80 years old, Sheikh Yusuf Karadawi, an anti-Semite, by the way, was brought from his uh, uh, exile home in Qatar to give a speech to a million people in the square, in which, amongst other things, he called to march on Jerusalem. But the guy from Google, while Rename, the guy who is credited with starting the Egyptian revolution, he also wanted to say a few things to the million people in the square. And the sags of the Muslim Brotherhood would not let him do so. All over the place, we see a growing role of the Muslim Brotherhood, which is in many ways is a single movement with international dimensions, with branches all over the place, including Hamas amongst the Palestinians. They are the ones probably best organized, best positioned to take advantage 
from this volcanic eruption, from the upheaval he evil, all over the Arab world. I'll give you an example about Egypt. In Egypt, what we see today is that the secret police, the Egyptian version of the Securitate, of the KGB, has collapsed completely. The head of the Egyptian Securitate, General Hassan Abdrahman, is in jail, as well as the interior minister, Mr. Adli, etc. They ransacked their offices and took out the files from the archives. They were the ones in charge of keeping an eye on the Muslim Brotherhood for 40 years or more. They were in charge of making sure the Muslim Brothers are not coming to power. And they did it. They performed their task the way they did, which is beyond this matter. Now, with the Egyptian Mabachis Amne Daulab and the Egyptian uh, secret police is gone, simply faded into thin air. And the Egyptian army, huge army, with 10 divisions, with more F-16 aircraft than the Israeli aircraft, the Egyptian army is politically impotent. Can't make a decision. The country, the biggest and single most important country in the Arab world, is ruled by a system which I call now squareocracy. It's the people in the square. And this Friday again, there were a million people in the square. And they were saying, we want President Mubarak prosecuted. And the army will give in, I'm telling you. Because the army in Egypt as elsewhere, has learned what we ever, what ever, all of us have learned over the past few months, that nobody can withstand the pressure of the masses. And this system of government, the squareocracy, is not an episode. It's not something which we are witnessing now and will be transformed into something else. No, no. Squareocracy is to stay. And every Friday, in every Arab country, you will have the square having its say. It's a totally different system of government than anything we have known anywhere. And the question, who is going to lead the square? In the referendum now for the amendments of the, on the Egyptian constitution concerning the election of a new president, we already saw, probably for the first time, an alliance between the Muslim Brotherhood and the army. All the good, nice liberals, all the Twitter and Facebook boys, everybody objected to the amendments as being insufficient. The Muslim Brotherhood supported it. And with the clout and the sex of rice and sugar that the Muslim Brotherhood uh, distributed to many, many people in Egypt, they easily won the referendum. The same, I'm sorry to inform you, I hope I'm wrong, although it's not my habit. Uh, the same we will see when we come to parliamentary elections and then presidential elections. I do believe the Muslim Brotherhood will not have a candidate. They are saying they will not run a candidate. Although, in brackets, one of their leaders, Abdel Futuch, already told yesterday a good friend of mine in Cairo that he is resigning the party in order to run. We all know the trick. But assuming they are not running, and assuming we, uh, we uh, accept what they are saying, that they will not seek a parliamentary majority in the next parliament in Egypt. Assuming we accept all that, we still have to keep in mind that they are going to decide the elections. It's their organized constituency. 
which will decide who gets elected where in many, many ways. The consequence is that we have to assume, now I'm speaking again as an Israeli, that the next regime we are going to see in Cairo, as well as in any other place in which we have a change of government. Syria is beginning to boil. Uh, the relationship with Israel will be affected more by the role of the Muslim Brotherhood and its local collaborators and affiliates. And therefore, relations between Egypt and Israel will not remain the same, will not remain the way we have known them for so many years since late President Sadat. I'll give two examples. First, the Egyptian government has completely lost control over the Sinai Peninsula. I'm saying completely lost control over the Sinai Peninsula, three times bigger than the State of Israel. I mean total loss of control over the Sinai Peninsula. It's the wild frontier now. It's ruled and governed by, by militias of armed tribes, smugglers, and roving bands. Two Egyptian battalions are guarding that hotel in which Mubarak and his family reside in Sharm el-Sheikh. Two battalions pretend to be looking after the border with Gaza, and that's it. We are assuming now that there will be attempts and we can see it happening, that Hamas, Islamic Jihad, Hezbollah, you name them, will try to use the vacuum created in the Sinai in order